Yeah, we have an excellent panel um, here today. So, quickly introduce um, Maxime from um, the Catalyst Fund, operating partner at Catalyst Fund. Um, so, that's an investor and an accelerator of startups working uh, towards achieving climate resilience. Um, we have uh, Doubt from Open Value Foundation. So they're, they're a, an investor um, based out of Spain, actually, an investor in uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, in uh, impact startups, uh, and doing a lot of work around really measuring that impact uh, before making uh, investments and measuring the impact of that investment then on the, on the companies. Uh, and we have uh, Kami, uh, the CEO uh, of Unity Networks, the uh, super app um, for uh, the unbanked to, to achieve financial inclusion, uh, and also uh, the founder of DevEx, um, the media uh, platform for the development community. That's what it says in the website. <laughs> <laughs> no, I added the, the That's our website. I, there I, we go. I added the <laughs> but it's a, it, I think it's a, it says a million uh, people on that network. So, yeah. Uh, just a round of applause for the. So yeah, we'll, we'll get started with a, a little bit of an intro from your, in your own words. Uh, maybe maybe you can you kick off there. Sure. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you all. I hate to stand between you and food and drinks, and so we'll keep it brief. Um, so yeah, Unity Networks. You know, one of the things in that last panel was super um, uh, relevant and, and clarifying in many ways. You know, one of our underlying theses is that many of the solutions for financial inclusion are already in existence. And several people in the panel said, hey, but you need a smartphone. Yeah, you need a smartphone. And you know, we talk about, GSMA talks about three billion people who don't have it. Google and everyone else wants to talk about um, the next billion. And if you solve that, which is treated as a, you know, a moonshot project to get the next billion, you still have two billion people just mathematically who are not part of your solution. And so what does the world look like if two billion people aren't part of the digital economy, what does the world look like if all of us who are doing human-centered design ignore two billion people on the planet who are the humans that we are serving? And so our solution is a super app, which reinforces local <coughs> solutions. Um, in other words, we're focused on health, on education, on finance, and on work. The super app uses local solutions, so we're operating today in Ghana. So we're looking at maternal health, general health, pension, insurance, banking, for populations using Ghanaian products, but our app stitches those solutions together with a data wallet, with uh, financing, device financing for the device itself, and an engagement model that makes that phone productive. You know, one of the big challenges with device financing or any kind of you know asset financing is the people have to pay the 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 principal plus the interest for that asset. Most people, when they get a phone, even those who have money and do this themselves, when you get the phone, you're downloading YouTube and WhatsApp and other stuff. You're not downloading a pension app or a banking app or a health app. And all these things that can drive productivity of the asset that you bought is where we're focused. So our long-term solution is can we get smartphones in the hands of all individuals who want them with access to at least, but also whatever. You can still download TikTok and WhatsApp. but at least using health, financial, and services that, in general, improve your livelihood. Thanks. Doubt? Yes, so basically, I mean, um, I've, I've, I've worked with uh, impact investment and, uh, and livelihood improvements, I mean, for I mean, a better part of my life, I would think my professional life, like six years now. I'm, I'm, I'm pretty <coughs> new. So, and we all understand investment, and so of course, when it is mentioned, many, many, many always think of, you know, their returns, you know, on investments mostly. But I think that um, on our aspect, we always try to really work closer to achieving um, financial inclusion. And so that is, I mean, the, 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 always the major point, you know, trying to achieve financial inclusion with, with respect to impact creation. And impact creation has to always do with, I mean, improvement of livelihood and also looking at sustainability measures that ensure the safety of people and the safety of the environment. 
So basically, at Impact Bridge, where I, I, I'm currently, uh, and I take it my, my, my intention. So we actually look at startups in, in the eyes of, of, of the impact creation, and we try to actually look at, I mean, what are some of the metrics, what are the KPIs, what do they know, what are they known for, what do they want to achieve in society, what are their contributions, and how do they measure this particular contribution, and to what extent is it beneficial to um, humanity at all. So these are some of the things we we, we, we analyze back at Impact Bridge, and um, we, we decide um, at what level we invest, is, uh, whether financial investments or technical assets that we give to this company, so that we achieve some level of stability, um, where we, I mean, we could see that, I mean, they, they have the foundation right and they have a particular point when I mean they could also make I mean some returns when it comes to I mean financial investment. So I think basically this is this is this is the profile I work with and, and, and in the most part of the discussion I mean maybe my 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 views will not be same thing. Um yeah so on my side Maxim I'm a partner with the Catalyst Fund which uh, is with an organization that was created seven years ago now. Uh, initially, we were focused on uh, giving grants and accelerating uh, startups in specifically in financial inclusion or financial resilience, as we like to call it, um, uh, sector, uh, mainly in Africa, but also a little bit in India and Mexico. We had the chance to work in the early days with companies like Cheaper Cash, Russell Co., uh, Koi Wise, Quara, and, and, and many more. Um, that had you know, some interesting developments afterwards. Um, about two, three years ago, we realized that uh, our role catalyzing uh, more investment in, the, in, in, the, in that space uh, was a little bit less impactful because there was already a lot of funding going to the fintech space. Um, so we decided to, to shift focus to what we call climate resilience, so climate adaptation and resilience now. And also, uh, we're focusing from uh, grants funding to now equity investments, um, but still providing venture building and uh, cash investments. So we, this dual approach has always been our uh, sort of signature. And so, yeah, for the past two years now, we're backing startups in the climate adaptation space in Africa. What we mean by climate adaptation is basically tech solutions that allow people uh, across the continent to better adapt to the negative effect of climate change. So if you want the not the opposite, but the, let's say, other side of climate change fight, uh, one being mitigation, the other one being adaptation. So we try to, uh, to catalyze a little bit more funding in the, in the latter, uh, I would say, yeah. Thanks very much. Um, so just to get, uh, to get stuck in uh, on the topic um, of financial inclusion, first of all, um, and I will we'll also uh, discuss the sort of nuances and the changes in the trends between um, what people focus their time on uh, so the, the narrative on at least it, it, at the strategic level has been financial inclusion but now we're also moving a lot of funds and a lot of discussion towards um, climate adaptation, climate resilience um, <coughs> so we'll touch on that uh, in a bit but to start with uh, um, for the financial inclusion in the past five years um, Kami um, how far uh, have we come uh, on that path towards achieving financial inclusion? Um, so I don't know the numbers. I, the, the, I, I know the Sparkfoot numbers. So people here probably know the financial inclusion numbers better. There are two things that I think matter a lot in terms of the last five years. One is digital. the digitalization of service access probably has advanced 15 years in the last five years because of the pandemic. You know, it, it went from being perceived as a privilege in a sense and a hardship. You know, those, those who are financially digitally included sometimes treat it as a hardship, you know, I'm doom scrolling and all these other things. Um, but actually, you know, in the global north, schools stayed open-ish through the pandemic, access to hospitals stayed open-ish. Many, many parts of the world, that was not the case. People just didn't go to school for, for two years because there wasn't a digital infrastructure. A lot of digital solutions in the past 10 years have worked around smartphone and banking access. You know, mobile money is, hey, we don't need to bank people. It, it actually, banking actually is better. You get interest if you get banked. Mobile money is a fantastic band-aid, but it's not a solution for, for uh, proper financial inclusion. Um, and, and the other thing, just to, to build a, a little bridge, sorry to borrow the word, a little bridge here is 
access matters a lot. And I think the thing that we learned during the pandemic is access to services matters. We thought, hey, you know, you can't leave your house and you can't do this and that. And so we are temporarily don't have access to things. The communities that we're all working in have lived like this for decades. There's, it's not that there suddenly there isn't access. There, you know, the community that that we're working in in Ghana, there is one. There's zero banks. There's one credit association. There's zero hospitals and there's zero schools. That's just the status quo. If you have a smartphone and apps that connect you to some of those services, your your choice has exploded in a way that is it's almost hard to navigate. That's the other part of our solution is we help you navigate those choices. Um, so I think I would just say in summary that um, our awareness and empathy around access to services, I think dramatically changed. We always have operated as though the curve is going up into the right and we saw for three years that it doesn't always. And we read about other communities where actually this was uh, substantially altering, not in an inconvenience sense, but in access to basic life, uh, life supporting services. And so I think that awareness has changed the way that the Global North companies are even participating in solution design. And um, you mentioned access as a, as a key for the availability in that sort of um, aspect, the availability of the, of the tools um, uh, in, in the communities um, that we're working in. Um, and Dow, uh, we had an interesting uh, conversation earlier about um, the different pillars alongside access that are uh, essential. Um, so when you're thinking about the, the individual, uh, the impact on the individual, unbanked or underbanked, uh, what other pet pillars aside from access have you, uh, have you witnessed as, as necessary to, to, to carry to get to financial inclusion? Yes, so I think precisely, uh, I don't always want to get myself talking big about financial inclusion because I really think that, like my colleague mentioned earlier on, um, it is about accessibility. And not just accessibility, it's also about affordability. So one thing is to make a service available, accessible, and uh, but it is entirely a different thing when you're talking about affordability. If one cannot afford it, that person will definitely will be able to access it. So these are some of the things we are always here around when you're talking about financial inclusion. So, and to be able to really understand the impact we've made, the progress we've made, the, 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 the distance we've changed so far, I think that it is always very critical that we look at the accessibility issues. What are the hindrances? What are the noises? What are the nuisances that, 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 that is blocking people from really accessing financial services? It's one about, I mean, I'm talking of Africa, it is one about energy. Accessibility to energy, energy usage. You know, technology actually is built on technology on, on energy. You know, the mobile phone you use, the cell phone you use, if you don't have energy, you don't have access to electricity, you're not able to use it. So people on one hand are not able to access this because they don't even have access to energy in the first place. And when you look at uh, the UN reports, I mean across the years, I mean, they are always staggering numbers when it comes to you know people in Africa that do not have access to electricity. And you try to transpose that, you look at these numbers and you think that, oh, if these people do not have access to um, electricity, then how do they also play around with technology? You know, and if you don't have access to technology, how do they live their lives? So these are some of the pressing questions you, you, you begin ask, asking yourself. And of course, me, I, 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 was, I, was, I was born in rural northern Ghana. I mean, I don't know how many of you are from, I know Ghana very well, so, but I'm from a rural community. And in my community where I come from, till date, there is zero bank, like you indicated, there is no people tell, I mean, approach the average person on, the, on your way and ask, what's a bank? The person not able to tell you. I mean, they think that bank is for the rich people. This is who earns salaries, you know? I don't, I don't earn salary. What association do I have with the bank? I mean, but these are the kind of people we are talking of when you're talking of impact. We are not talking of the race, we are not talking of those who earn salaries. They know they are left from their rights. When we are talking of impact, it is about those who are neglected. And sometimes we use different phrases to, I mean, try to call them the underserved and the privileged. I mean, the reality is that these are poor people. These are poor people. They don't have access to finance. They don't have access to money. 
How many live a lie? So I mean, financial inclusion is a bit dynamic. So sometimes we always talk of the to to be able to really understand the impact. I mean, I think that we should always analyze some of the accessibility factors, the impediments. You know, you try to look, you count energy, for instance, it is one of them. You look at the extent at which I mean, we have we have, we have come 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 up with ideas on how to give um, alternative energy solutions to the to, to deprived communities. And you, you try thinking about the impact we are creating. You know, you give solar panels to people, to societies, that's an impact you are making. And what, what do they use it for? They use it to, 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 to be able to use their mobile phones. What do they use their mobile phones for? They use mobile phones for mobile money. Majority of people in their community, for instance, they have mobile phones. They have mobile money, but they don't, they're not on bank. They don't have access to the bank. It's a crazy thing for any CEO of a bank to say that they are going to establish a branch in my community. It's crazy. They wouldn't do that. But they have mobile phones, and they are on mobile money. You give them solar panels, they're able to charge their mobile mobile phone, do mobile money. That's financial inclusion. That's financial inclusion. In general, that's financial inclusion. So and this is what you, you, you get to understand when you when you, when you try accessing some of these things. Look at education. Education is one of the impediments. Let's not take it for it. It's not a joke. Education is one of the things. If you're able to address educational needs of people, they will have access to financial inclusion. Why? You see, like I indicated to ten, I mean, when we were, when we were at the basement, you see, one ten is actually to know that you know, I mean, I've acknowledged that I really have a problem. When you don't acknowledge that I have, you have a problem. The problem is in no way solved. It is as great as it's still hundred percent a problem. But when you acknowledge, you are able to identify this. I have a problem, and this is my problem. It is how it's done. What you need now is action. The point is that, you know, this financial inclusion, that is financial services. People are ignorant about financial services. They don't know what they even call financial inclusion. You talk of savings, they don't know what is savings. If you don't save, how do you live a life? How do you live a life on earth? You don't, you don't know savings. You know, these people, you create opportunities for them. The, all they do is that, okay, they, they, they really explore these opportunities, raise money, and they spend the money the very time they make them. And the next moment, they are done with malaria. The child is done with malaria. Either the mother, the father, or the brother is done with malaria. They don't have access to money. They think that, wow, the salary earners should come and give them money. Because they don't know savings. But the salary earners no savings. So, I mean, these are some of the dynamics we get ourselves talking about when we're talking about financial inclusion. So, to an extent that you're able to address the educational needs of people, you get to, you look, you look at the statistics, you look at the number of people that are getting educated day in day out in North Africa. I mean, through our efforts as NGOs, I mean, and, and, and startups that are, that are ready to create impact. So, you look at the numbers that are rising every day, I mean, get, join the rest of us in, in the education field, like, okay, wow, this is the impact that we are creating. Financial literacy is very key. So when, when you look at the numbers and you look at the number of people that are joining in the knowledge base of financial literacy, you get to understand that these are the numbers that we are really impacting. These are the numbers we are impacting. So I think that, I mean, I mean, the issue of affordability has to do with when we are trying to analyze the gaps. Other than that, affordability is also one of the factors, mm -hmm. the critical factors. And like I indicated, like the banking services, accessibility to banks, financial institutions, they are non-existent. So I think one of the biggest impact that we've, we've all made together is the fact that we've been able to ride on technology to be able to, you know, um, give people access to this some of these I mean services on the on their mobile phones. They access it through their mobile phones. I mean during the I mean when you look at I mean Statista, what they did one of their reports and they issue it and you get to realize that you know of the people that they've actually interviewed, I mean just to just, just to estimate. They estimated at about, about 350 million Africans who don't have access to banking. They have to say unbanked. Let's call it the unbank. And out of this 150, 155 says that, oh, they have mobile phones on their own. 200 said, okay, well, I don't have mobile phone on my own, but I can access one at home. So the point is that our real impact, our real contribution for the five for these five years is that we've actually built sustainable societies and households either consciously or unconsciously so the point is the point is that once you address the mobile money phone needs of a household is going to impact the general household just one person the 200 million says that they have access to mobile phone at home so if there is financial inclusion through mobile phone all the 200 million people benefit from it 
And there's financial inclusion. The 155 million will say that, okay, well, uh, I mean, it has addressed my, the, my, my problem personally. They're able to use the mobile phone to access financial services. So, I mean, Cynthia, I think in short, this is, this is my, <laughs> my contribution. This is my contribution to the fact of the, the extent, the, the, the gains you've made with the activity this particular five years period. Yes. <laughs> Maybe if I can add a couple of things yeah, on the point of inclusion. I mean, it's actually quite striking when you look at the statistics in Kenya, for instance, because that's always shown as the poster child of financial inclusion in Africa, and the, the reality is a little bit uh, more nuanced. Um, and maybe uh, not as great as what we wanted to depict. So one thing that we started to look at and a couple of other players in the space is actually financial health versus financial inclusion. So if you're just talking about pure access to basically mobile money, the Kenya financial inclusion as in like people who have, and base account is actually over 80% now in the country. So, you know, we could be quite happy about that and everybody likes it. The problem is that this doesn't solve the problem of financial health. I mean, you have, a, you have basically a tool to move money. Uh, it doesn't make you financial healthy in the sense that you cannot necessarily cope with the day to day. You cannot necessarily plan for the future. You cannot uh, save money as it was shared earlier. And so I think looking at financial health is a way more, uh, it's a way more, uh, uh, let's say, curate way to look at this, at this problem. And when you look at this matrix, actually there's a bit of a scissor effect. So the more financial inclusion grows, the, the more financial health uh, was done. And now in Kenya, the data statistic says that one in five persons uh, actually cannot cope with day to day, cannot plan for the future, cannot save. So despite the fact that everybody has m account. So I think it's you know now quite important to go a little bit beyond just basic access, which is still yet to be sold. I mean, you still have 45% of the population that doesn't have any bank account. But beyond access is, um, you know, do you have actually economic power to leverage these tools? I mean, it's great to have a uh, you know, super way, super cheap way to transfer money across Africa, and there are many startups doing that now. Uh, but if you don't have money earnings at the end of the day, uh, that's pretty much useless. So I think it's you know, that's the kind of thing that we start to look at, you know, more about resilience and financial health rather than, than just basic access to a tool that uh, you may not use. If you know. Yeah. Can I just yeah, add, well, there's something I want to pick up on. So, talk about mobile phone access versus smartphone access, and it's a it's a substantial difference. You know, that using smartphones and using apps, we are building a digital footprint that isn't just about resilience; it's about economic preparedness for the economy of the future. When we talk about credit scoring, you're not building a credit profile on a USSD service for mobile money. And so, the, the these workarounds that we've come up with for poor communities. They solve the problem for a period of time, and I take my hat off to them. I, you know, I'm not opposed to the, those solutions for for their time. But as we think about generative AI and the way that Netflix and Spotify and all these things know us better than we know ourselves, because we're feeding data into those things, economic preparedness is about owning your own data in the future and building a data profile that is machine readable at all. And without that, I don't know how people, as you say, will function in the economy of ten years from now. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so there's a lot of uh, nuances to unpack there. Um, and I want to uh, pick up on the, on the last point, um, Maxine, you mentioned about um, the change in the, the word financial inclusion not being enough, not being uh, something that should be perhaps focused on because it doesn't encompass what we're really trying to achieve. Um, you mentioned financial, financial health uh, there. Uh, and then going a few steps forward forward you, you know you, you go towards resilience so in your words um, you know why why is the narrative why should the narrative now be focused towards um, resilience and, and climate resilience um, as opposed to um, financial inclusion you hinted at it um, but as well as the shocks that were already in, in place in for uh, communities, um, now you have the additional impacts of climate change. Um, can you talk a, bit, a little bit about, about that and, and uh, what you can use now? Yeah, I mean, uh, in a lot of cases, you know, financial resilience and climate resilience are very much linked. Um, uh, you know, definitely, if you're better well off, 
uh, you're more resilient to climate change, uh, whether it's uh, heat or cold or natural disasters or anything. So uh, that's def definitely clear. Um, the topic of climate adaptation, in I know, views, especially in Africa, is, is, is extremely critical. Um, if we take uh, last year alone, 2022, we had 110 million people that were directly affected by climate change. Uh, across the continent, despite the fact that Africa is the, the smallest contributor in terms of continent to, to CO, global CO2 emissions with around 3 to 4 percent. So there's this, um, you know, this uh, the paradox across the continent. Um, and so getting people to, to be more resilient is, in terms of, you know, timeline, uh, is actually quite, quite urgent. Um, well, you know, we're all in for, you know, Reducing CO2 emissions, and um, you know, if you acquire, a, let's say, a, a car for the first time, you're in Africa, or a motorbike for the first time, fantastic. If it's an EV, I mean, electric vehicle, if you get connected to electricity for the first time, great. If it's solar powered, uh, but at the end of the day, this is not going to make you more resilient to climate change. Um, it's going to maybe reduce the amount of pollution locally. It's going to reduce the amount of CO2 emissions. For the future generations to come, it's not going to help you with the droughts that will affect your your harvest next season. Um, so that's really what we want to double down on, while factoring in mitigation as well. But really making sure that we are also, you know, working on innovations that help people to cope with climate change today, because the effects are already there. We have seen, you know, floods in Libya just like a couple of weeks ago, um, droughts across East Africa, pretty much every year now, and getting worse. Water scarcity, massive problem um, across across the, the continent. So, this is a problem today, and uh, if we don't start working on solution, really solutions today, uh, then you know we can do as much as we want on, on CO two emissions. Uh, a lot of people will have to be displaced. A lot of people will be affected. So, um, yeah, that's really why we believe there is an emergency uh, right now to to look at this topic and. To link back to the discussion on uh, measuring impact, the, one of the challenges we face is that uh, while it's fairly easy to measure CO2 emissions, I mean fairly, um, and it's a great metric for all the donors and all the NGOs and so on because we can all align on it and like we can count the amount of CO2 we have reduced or captured and so on. Uh, when it comes to climate adaptation, there's not one single metric that you can look at. I like, cannot say you know, maybe millions of lives that are more adapted, but if we look at our, across our portfolio, we have 16 companies, and when it comes to impact, you know, some of them are tracking the amount of water generated through desalination, some are, are tracking the amount of uh, acres of fields uh, sustainably uh, managed or transitioned to regenerative agriculture, some are tracking uh, more healthcare elements, so it's quite disparate, and that makes it a bit of a challenge, and probably is one of the reasons why there is way less funding right now going to this uh, uh, challenge despite the fact that you know, all um, UN agencies are pointing at climate adaptation being extremely urgent in the, in the fight against climate change. So yes, that's the that's the battle we're in um, and um, we, you know, we do believe that you know there's a lot of really great innovations out there that can help people cope with that, especially in, field, in fields like uh, agriculture for instance, uh, but also healthcare. Um, so, you know, we get a lot of questions, for instance, from other investors when we tell them that we're looking at healthcare. We are we're focused on climate adaptation, but looking at healthcare solution, healthcare startup. Um, and the main reason for that is that right now across the continent, you, you know, we have roughly one in two events, even health events, that are actually directly triggered or aggravated by climate change. Think, uh, you know, uh, vector borne diseases like you know, malaria or. Um, you know, uh, DASA fever, yellow fever, um, think uh, respiratory disease and so on. These things are directly impacting and it's it, sadly, you know, it's just going to, to grow by significant multiple each year. So um, having access, better access to healthcare is actually a great way for, for people to be more adapted to climate change quite, uh, quite directly. So um, yeah, so it's actually a fairly, fairly wide uh, road. So, yeah. <coughs> Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, I'm trying to understand the difficulty in um, measurement and, and selection of, and therefore selection of in investees that will then carry out this impact, which is a future impact. So it's not like it's uh, measurable on day one. So you have to wait till the climate impact, climate uh, uh, 
catastrophe or, or change might happen. But for GNG, we don't have to wait too much. Because they, they yes, do have already, already, yeah. you know, if you think about, uh, for instance, parametric insurance for, uh, for farming, uh, one of the challenges of these solutions, for instance, is that uh, there's you know, so much droughts right now and so much um, you know, floods <coughs> or the else, extreme, else, uh, extreme uh, weather events that basically, if you, if you have uh, in your <coughs> customer base a lot of farmers in the same region, they're all going to uh, basically claim for. Uh, um, for reimbursement at the same time, right? And this is like year over year, so it's it's making those monetization model quite tricky. Mm -hmm. um, so because of the recurrence, increased recurrence of these events. Right, right, right. Um, so if we can move on to on the on the positive side of like, um, we touched on a few um, the companies that that are in your portfolio, Maxime, but uh, Cami, um, we, we, you know, companies that. Um, that inspire you in terms of solutions to some of these um, issues, uh, yours yourself, your community uh, networks, how that's working. Um, if you know solutions that come to mind that are sort of key drivers towards uh, achievement of or resilience, uh, adaptation towards uh, climate effects, um, financial health. Yeah. Yeah, I'll just say if you don't keep it very short, I mean, the, just some of the things in our portfolio, in our uh, app suite in Ghana, and some that I've heard about beyond. Uh, for financial literacy, there's a there's a service called FinEasy, which helps actually do financial literacy. They sell their service to banks, and it improves the banking relationship between the customer and the bank. Um, there is, you know, telemedicine solutions. There are three or four just in Ghana and Kenya. There must be many, many more. Uh, they all have slightly different paradigms, like what the, in, in Spain, I live here in Barcelona, in Spain, I don't know the exact number, but uh, anecdotally, it feels like 60 or 70% of your health issues are dealt with at the pharmacy, because they give you some kind of a feedback. In the US, where I'm from, none of those, the pharmacists can't even talk to you, they're on a dais far away, and so all healthcare gets handled in hospitals, and it overwhelms hospitals. Digital access from a village before you take a 30 kilometer bus trip to take your daughter to the hospital. It's useful just to do a call and say, hey, is this a problem? It's a huge resource to save. Um, on the AI side, there's a group called Abena.ai, which is doing voice, uh, voice translation in local languages so that services become usable by people who have literacy uh, challenges. There, the, and this is, this is the thing I said at the beginning, the solutions are there. There are innovators outside of this room and inside this room that are doing really, really impressive things. If we don't get people on the platforms, if we don't get people with access to the energy, the finances, and the smartphones, then this whole world of innovation is, remains out of there, out of reach. And so um, we like to think of this as trying to build like a floor that maybe uh, maybe gives access to more and more people. I could go on now. I'll, if, if you want to share it internally, I'll send you a list of the apps that were talking to, but it's across education. Ubongo in Kenya is great for numeracy and for literacy. Um, I'm on the board of a digital reading group called World Reader that curates and packages uh, content for. So there's a whole range of stuff that's happening digitally that is really about. Yeah, that would be great to share, actually. Um, uh, and in terms of that, what um, gives you hope that there, we are on that path to, to improving uh, lives of unbanked um, poor communities, um, the models that you've seen that you um, are able to measure the impact on. Um, what, what, what aspects do you give you hope on? You see, the aspect that will actually give me hope is the paradigm which we are working on, you know, and for which reason, you know, most startups are beginning to incorporate or to even build their business models around. You know. You know, when you look at, uh, I mean, when I analyze some companies, particularly in Africa, I think I've analyzed uh, quite a few companies in Kenya and some in Ghana, my own country, and it gives me, I mean, that particular hope that, you know, that people, all the people are raising along. They know, they know what we are doing now, and they, they know the dangers of the, their harmful actions they are also doing in their own quarters. So I think they are beginning to think, you know, and they're thinking and thinking well. 
So uh, when you look at Kenya, there's a women group that is working on you know improving cities for um, rural families. And this is not just about the rural families, but it's about, you know, due to the climate change, you know, the climate change actually affects different people in lowland and highland areas. So because of it, they, and most of the farmers are often located in the lowland areas, I mean, in Kenya. So these women have actually, I mean, I mean had this particular intervention that is um, aimed at improving the seas, you know, that the, the that can withstand the climate change in the lunar areas, you know. So this is this 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 kind of go a long way to avoid you know the post harvest losses and all the all the other nuisances that comes along with the the, 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 the the production cycle. You know, and you, you look at it and you say that oh wow, I mean, we are not the only people thinking about about sustainability. You know, the people at the bottom of it are also thinking about it. You look at Eco Nexus, they are also a company in Ghana. And how they are applying the notion of you know renewable energies to turn the lives of um, industries around the food, the food industry precisely in Ghana, you know. And you look at it and you say, oh wow, this is a great development. This is a sustainable development, you know. And why, where does it emanate from? Does it emanate from the the highest echelons? No. This is this is a thinking from the very basement, from the bottom of the pyramid, people within. Are thinking loud on this kind of particular thing. So it gives hope that, of course, if I even develop something, thinking it is complex, it is a very possibility that, I mean, when it sends down to the people at the, at the DOP, they will support it, you know, and, and, and be ready to move away from the old ways to the new ways. So when you see this kind of reasoning, I think that it is a dawn of, uh, of, of an era where everybody take along safety lines, sustainability lines. So I think that that's one of the things that always give me a little hope that of course, I mean, in the in the in the in the, in the future, I mean things will look better because when the people causing the harm are aware that I mean they are we, they are they are worse exposed and they begin looking for solutions around themselves. I mean it gives hope to ever to ever to ever, ever, ever person that of course I mean things will change. But it is only when you know, the people don't respond to changing factors. I mean, always try to stay at very comfortable at the things they do, though they are harmful. I mean, that is where it is always disheartening, you know, to look at, to look back and think about the future, you know. But when you see this particular, you know, dimension, different ways of really surviving, you know, along changing times and environment, then you think that, of course, I mean, there is, there is, there is a great hope. And if there is a this significant contribution that, I mean, no efforts has created along Africa. So when I think, like I mentioned earlier, with the paradigm shift, you know, um, I think when you look at the UN contribution precisely about banking, the UN actually want to use some of these initiatives, you know, with regards to the Bitcoins and the mobile monies, you know, right on these technologies to be able to improve financial inclusion. You look at it and you look at it and you understand, you begin asking questions. Where will they all this white? And, you know, they were where they were, and where were they? They were actually at that particular point. They create bigger monsters that eat up people that are, that even rise for financial influences. You know, UN have always worked with African governments, the politicians, and these politicians they least represent the people. But one thing that technology has actually brought, and which is helpful, and which I mean, you know, the contributions are beginning to present alongside, is the fact that you can even sit here and design solutions that can solve a larger public. Outside there, we are going through the government. You don't go to government to look at the number of, number of people. I mean, what is the percentage of people with BOP? No, you design a technology for your target audience, and from Europe, you can shoot it and it get to Africa where you want it to be. It will go there to the people directly themselves, and whatever impact it creates, it creates direct impact. You know, what are the days? You know, because the UN, in a, in a very you know, their manner, what they do is that they approach these politicians, they do give donations, 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 and what they do is that. They, they hijack these donations, that this person hijack these donations, and at the end of the day, when they demand accountability, they go somewhere, apply makeups on their wives and children, and they send it to them with a laughing and say, Oh, you have achieved your target. But the people beyond the, below the, uh, the, the pyramid are actually suffering. Nothing has been done. So I think the BOP, when you look at it, and you look at the manner in which technology is targeting, targeting the people and improving lives, you understand that? I mean, that particular paradigm shift alone, that shift alone, is a good thing for us. It's a good hope. And if you continue in that particular uh, trajectory, what it means is that we're going to achieve the most results. 
when the UN, when they, when they look at the statistics and they try to, to make projects, and they make projects on the strength of our contributions, not the donations they are giving to the, our governments. Yeah. So I think that with that particular paradigm shift, I mean, it's a, it's a, it gives a breathing space to, I mean, um, a, a, a more of a stressful person that, that looks on helpless on, you know, some of those those, those sports statistics. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah, it's, it's good that you mentioned the sort of grassroots, um, sort of raising of awareness as the starting point to um, that um, understanding that there are solutions and then meeting all those solutions from uh, other stakeholders, you know, um, initiatives that we talked about. So there may be availability, there may be um, they're uh, able to solve some of those problems, but then without the education, without the understanding, then you wouldn't have that meeting in the middle of solution being used. So the, the, the point about seeing that there is grassroots awareness and drive towards solutions, hopefully we'll get Get somewhere in the middle. And so, um, um, Maxime, uh, just quickly on um, some solutions in your portfolio, one, one or two that you feel that are you know, the most uh, exciting. Um, yeah, so uh, I'll give you a couple of examples. Uh, one of them is in Morocco. They mm -hmm. basically turn uh, desert into arable land. Um, so they, they work in close to the Atlas Mountains, uh, close to the, the sea. They basically um, uh, tap um, into what's called brackish water, which is basically water that is uh, with high salinity because it's regenerated by the sea. So it's not directly the sweet water aquifer. Um, so it's actually more renewable. Um, and with this water, they, they then basically uh, build uh, farms um, that are leveraging um, agroforestry principles, so basically mixing the different seeds um, uh, without using any uh, fertilizer, any pesticides, uh, except um, you know, biochar or like um, bio um, um, fertilizer and uh, leveraging the, the capacity of the plants to basically give each other what, what, what they need, right? So they would put basically a, a row of, um, of let's say, um, fig trees to um, really blot the wind uh, because there's a lot of wind there and then they will put um, I don't know, uh, pomegranates uh, because they will bring the, the azote needed by the fig trees and so on. So it's basically the science of no, knowing how to, to mix the plants together which is not new, it's actually very old uh, science um, but we have forgotten a little bit about it and there, there, the goal is to, um, uh, to basically uh, show that you can uh, scale um, farming uh, using this, this principle. So the idea is not to oppose uh, like bio farming and uh, large scale farming, but actually have uh, intensive farming based on regenerative principle. Um, so they have already one farm of 30 hectares in, uh, in uh, close to, uh, close to um, a region called La Place Blanche, White Beach in um, Morocco, and they have the plans to have, to have many more. Um, they have this crazy goal that I told them, maybe don't tell it to investors the first meeting, um, <laughs> that is basically to basically have farms that are big enough in a concentrated region that eventually uh, it will rain back in the region, uh, which only happens you know, once in a while, once a couple of years there. Uh, but it's, you know, the, 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 the water cycle is so that if you're able to generate enough humidity from the, from the plants in a, in a local area, you're able to uh, basically make it rain again. So that's, that's the goal, uh, so not to do a couple of hectares, but actually do thousands of hectares. And they're called Sand to Green, and, uh, and, they, and they leverage uh, solar panels for the, to pump the water uh, as well. So it's all um, very sustainable, and they're able to do that with just a little bit of water. So, um, and the, the yields are twice as much as conventional agriculture. But of course, as you were saying earlier, it takes time. You know, it's nature, there's not, uh, there's no, not a lot of tech that you can use to make plants grow faster. So you're a little bit bound by, by this, uh, which means that as investors, you know, we know it's not going to be a, a three years sort of play, we need to be here for a longer run. Yeah. So nature-based solution takes time. So um, that's one of them. The other one, maybe uh, just to, to give another example, something completely different. Um, they do uh, air carbon capture, direct air carbon capture. It's a company called Octavia in Kenya, maybe some of you know, some of them. Some of them. 
and um, yeah, so it's, this is not necessarily new globally, but uh, in Africa they are the first ones to do it, uh, and basically capturing uh, carbon from from air and um, and then uh, sort of like injecting it in, in, in the rocks. So the, 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 the physical attributes of, of Kenya makes it a particular good place to do that. Um, and they have already been able to sell the first uh, um, couple of carbon credits based on that. So um, yeah, so it's a, it's a bit more a moonshot, but, um, but also very, um, very exciting. And um, the last one I wanted to add, because it's true that in my previous words I said it was a little bit dark uh, uh, setup, but uh, there is also a real opportunity for Africa to be positioned not only as a, as a victim of climate change, but as, as part of the solution. Um, there is abundant land, uh, abundant you know, sun energy, um, uh, of course, huge demographics, um, and you know, already a couple of cases in, in history of the continent being able to, to leapfrog uh, truly, um, talked about you know telecommunication. You know, fixed line was never a thing in Africa. Um, same for banking. You know, like jump directly to mobile money in many countries. Um, well, maybe when it comes to the you know, green economy, uh, there's a, an opportunity if we hurry a bit to for Africa to, to jump straight to solutions that are um, way more sustainable for the for, for the climate. Agriculture is one example. I mean, there's a lot of small farmers. Kenya is 80% of the farming comes from small the farmers. Maybe before all these small the farmers move to intensive agriculture, they can also embrace regenerative agriculture principles. Um, and so leapfrog directly to, to this kind of uh, solution, same for you know, vehicles, energy, yeah. and everything. So that's, in our views, a real, uh, real opportunity for the continent. Great. Thanks, thanks very much. And um, so uh, I think uh, I'll open up to to the audience now on any questions in the last uh, few minutes. I'd like to hear uh, a bit more about the community that you built. Uh, what's that about? Oh, that is. Yeah. So <clears throat> that document is found in the year 2000. Um, 2000. So, <laughs> a long time ago. Um, so it's, you know, we thought of it as the Bloomberg for the development sector, tracking all the public money and being a media presence so that any money coming from uh, donor agencies, multilaterals, bilaterals that you know, you know, it's a dark art. Uh, someone mentioned on the previous panel, let's blockchain it and tr track where it's going. This was a uh, web 1.0 solution for blockchaining where the money is going, just report on who's spending what, who's winning it, where is it being implemented, does it work? Um, and so it's an ongoing concern. I, I stepped down from my role in 2019. Um, but you know they're covering Anga and WHO meetings and, and those kinds of things, and so it's it's a practitioner-focused community. So all the consultants who are implementing projects around the world, they become members, they figure out what's going on, and they can connect with one another and with the businesses who are winning uh, public tenders. It's been also used to raise funds, or it's mainly used and. Uh, no, the funding is mostly. I mean, there's uh, roughly <coughs> 250 uh, billion U.S. dollars a year spent in this space. Uh, not counting sort of Gates, Rockefeller kind of money, there's about 250 billion. So that's where the funding is coming with, but it's not bottom up funding like the crowdfunding model, it's government and international organization funding. <coughs> questions? How do you want to use it first? Um, yes, to, so going back to the, um, the title of the panel, which I think is Climate Resilience and Financial Inclusion, right? playing a bit the David's advocate there, but some would say that in some respect, financial inclusion can go against climate resilience because it also increases the affordability of uh, non-environmental friendly uh, food like uh, appliances by some households. So I don't know if you have ever uh, looked into that type of hypothesis and assumption. Is it something that has already been uh, verified on the ground to some extent, uh, if not, well, great. <laughs> if that can be the case, uh, do you have perspectives on mitigation uh, mechanism to that type of risk uh, to financial inclusion, which obviously should remain uh, one, uh, one major objective? So, so you're, you're talking about the fact that basically thanks to financial inclusion, people are able to access 
buying more goods. And stuff yeah, exactly. Like, like more goods, but also uh, where you don't have, I think it's also going back a bit, a bit to what you said about leapfrogging and immediate access to green technology. If you don't have yet the access to green technology, I mean, uh, green energy, then the energy you're going to buy with financial inclusion, with the affordability coming with financial inclusion, could actually be against uh, yeah, certain progresses on uh, climate change uh, topic. So, of course, yeah, no, like, that, that's a very valid point. Uh, you know, at Catalyst Fund, one of the reasons we also maybe moved a little bit away from um, financial inclusion investment is that uh, we became increasingly skeptical of models uh, that were basically sort of like allowing lending without any uh, limits um, and we were wondering if you know, these models were contributing more to the problem or the solution um, because you know there were a lot of you know, news articles around that as well but you know creating more uh, over in-depthness of people and you know less financial health um, so you know we definitely not at all for the you know pay as you go everything um, uh, this being said uh, Yes, if this can allow you to access, uh, you know, green energy or, in some cases, you know, green transportation, um, providing that the energy in the country is mainly renewable, like in Kenya, that works. If you do the same in Nigeria, it's silly because powering electric vehicles with uh, petrol powered uh, power plants doesn't make a lot of sense, but that's a reality uh, we're seeing. So, yeah, that's that's something that that could make sense. Um, but but you have you're definitely a fair point that uh, that you know, going into the you know buy now pay later for for any kind of goods across the continent is maybe not the kind of growth we want to uh, to fuel. <laughs> so, yeah. yes, I think my take precisely on that particular question because I mean it's a pressing question, and uh, I think in the on the side of impact investment uh, there is the criteria that is actually used to. Um, support or give some 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 kind of financial aid or assistance to I mean companies that came to the sustainability and financial inclusion is a component that we actually call the integrated dimensions. So the inte Sorry, integrated dimensions. Okay. You know these integrated dimensions try to sort of analyze the 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 the, the, the model. You know on several fronts. You look at the climatic aspect of it. You look at the humanity aspect of it, and you try to look at their value chain. You look, try to look at their supply chain. Analyze, look at their role, analyze everything, and see their environmental impacts or their impact society. So, whatever way possible that I mean, the way and manner in which it is processed or it is done could affect humanity or the environment in any way. So, I mean, this 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 always gives um, some kind of you know strength to. I mean, the to companies that actually, or some kind of, I mean, establishments that are so favorable in the aspect of, you know, an inclusive policy that try to look at all rounds, try to look at, you know, their raw materials, where they are sourced from, how they are made, you know, how they turn their raw materials to the finished goods, what processes are involved, and how how safe are the processes. I mean, you know, so I mean, I think in that particular manner, they are able to tackle. I mean, head on the aspect of you know the consequences of whatever action or process that is taking place within the chain. Mm -hmm. 